All right, I want to thank you all for being here, ladies, gentlemen, and Rick. He's also here. Uh, <laughs> my name is Kevin Rodrigo, and this is my own project presentation. So to get started, just a brief resume, who am I? I was born in Ontario, Canada, and on my first birthday, I moved here to Colorado, where I've stayed for just about 18 years now. Uh, relevant experience, all four years of my high school career, I have taken STEAM-related courses, architectural design last year, before that, robotics, mechanical design, tech one through three, and then three programming classes, intro to programming, uh, AQ principles, and AP Comp Sci A. I plan on majoring in construction and science at an undecided university at this time. But that leads me into my advisor committee. So for my expert advisor, I had Ms. Jeanette Rosenbaum. Can't thank her enough. She is a project manager specializing in the electric end. Uh, she's lead certified, which was the most major draw to her. She was very instrumental in the help of this project. Can't thank her enough. Paul and Tony Grito, mom and dad, support advisors, the money. Uh, anything for the project that I needed, they uh, funded for me. That's glue, foam core, exacto blade. <coughs> uh, I can't thank them enough either. I had Kate Reeves, support advisor, the fall man. Anytime anything went wrong, I just blamed Kate. It was a lot easier than blaming myself when I was usually the one at fault. I kept my own morale high at the expense of his. He took the role with pride. And, uh, <laughs> Justin Abbott, Sport Advisor, Proofreader, helped me convert my caveman speak into English in my journal so that other people could read it. But, and then she was also a massive creator. That leads me to the project itself. So inspiration, the uh, homeowner's conundrum, as I call it. How many people here have or would change something in their house? OK, yeah, that's about what I expected. And everybody I've talked to, it's just that. Everybody can find something wrong with their home. And to me, that's a huge bummer. You spend a bunch of time and money in one place, and you don't like certain aspects of it, that seems like a waste. So it made me ask the question, if I were to design my own home, what would it look like? Boom, that's a project right there. And on top of that, I'm also a big fan of the environment, so I wanted to make sure in the design, I was incorporating green elements. I wanted to make sure this home was as environmentally friendly as I could possibly make it. And so that was the other major aspect. Now, major project objectives. I want to become a proficient user of the Revit software, not only for this project, but also for professional application. It's widely used throughout the industry. And many other softwares like it can also be applied. You can apply skills from Revit into other software, so it would generally help me in a future career. Uh, I also want to develop the ability to make realistic and appealing home designs. If I'm working in construction and or architecture and I can't produce uh, appealing projects, I'm probably not going to be very good at my job. I'd like to make some money, so hopefully I could be that. I also want to create a professional, realistic looking scale model. For some reason, I'm just a sucker for those. I absolutely love them, so that was one of my main objectives. I also want to develop a feasible design slash plan to reduce the home's carbon footprint. Not only for this home project, as I likely won't be able to build it in the near future, if at all, because it does get quite expensive. We'll get into that later. I want to be able to apply that to anywhere I'm living. And the skills and knowledge I developed while researching LEED, I believe I can apply almost anywhere. I also want to develop the ability to complete a lengthy and extensive project. I have never done anything like this before, not only at this scale, but also at this time period. Uh, developing and working on something for this amount of time I thought was going to be a challenge. Didn't think I was capable of it, but I think I did pretty well and proved myself wrong. That's a useful skill to have. The logo. Uh, I have to explain this because Mr. Cones is holding my great hostage until I do. And so just getting right into it. Color choice, a light blue reminds me of a cloudless sky, sort of a uh, hopeful, happy, giddy feeling. Uh, it's supposed to be a dream home. It's supposed to be something that's happening. Green, obvious reasons, going green associated with environmental friendliness and stuff like that. Font choice, it's pretty on the nose. It's an architectural project. Both the H and G are made to look out like buildings. Pretty simple. Meaning, uh, HG architecture, the dreams of the day, you can't really see it, but it says power of the futures of tomorrow. It's a project I'm developing today that I hope to develop in the future. It's pretty on the nose. Now, getting into the timeline. Originally, I came into this with a whole lot of ignorance as to my abilities and as to how long a year was. I believe that I could build three models from scratch and also develop three individual Revit models from scratch as well. That was never going to happen, let alone in a year. If I had maybe two, three other partners, we might have gotten it done. But the three models was an entirely different challenge. That never would have happened. And so I'm revising the timeline, although it's a little bit blurry, I kept everything else more or less the same in terms of researching lead, in terms of researching power application. I just scaled it down to one Revit model that I would continually revise throughout the year. And then once I was comfortable with that revised uh, rev file, I would then convert it to a model. Moving into the home itself, the inspiration uh, in terms of styles, I borrowed from the museum style. The main things that I pulled from that, large glass windows and a relatively flat roof. Uh, from the Italian style, that you can see that there in the museum here, I pulled a generally square structure. I think there's elegance and simplicity. A square uh, with extensive use of masonry work, stonework. I wanted to utilize that. I thought it looked appealing, and so I applied it there. Uh, also, the open concept. 
I'm a big fan of space. I have five siblings. I've learned to respect that quite a lot. And so I wanted to make sure that in my home, I could feel comfortable in the space that I have. And also the Roman Tuscan Villas, really the only thing you need to know that I pulled from this was the interior courtyard, basically an open air space within the four walls of the home. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Going back to the initial steps. Uh, initial structure, I built this the first day of the project. You can see it's pretty rudimentary. I just, like I said, it's a one day build. But it also reminded me that I am not as good with thread as I thought I was. I couldn't remember even how to make this a multi-level structure. I could make it a simple level with the roof, but I needed to uh, be able to make it multi-level as I didn't want a one-story cabin. And that's where Mr. Combs came in very clutch with the log cabin tutorials. Can't thank him enough for those. Those were a great refresher, and I referred back to them constantly in developing the project. Without these, I would have taken way more time, likely wouldn't finish the project. Uh, development, strong initial development. I was more worried about the start of the project as initial uh, as creative freedom. It's both a blessing and a curse. Without structure, you really have to uh, struggle to find that starting point. But once you're into the group of things, you can kind of get into it and roll with it. Snowballing, as I call it. But uh, that was my main point. I was worried about where I would start. But you know, given that it's a square, it's not a very hard start. Draw a square <laughs> with walls, go from there. Uh, that's the reason why I love it. The revenue is great. It's very comprehensive, very easy to use, and also it has plenty of built-in assets. Everything you see in there, all the kitchenware, your furniture, your TVs, all of that, Revit had built in. So I didn't have to spend time importing it, and more importantly, I didn't have to spend time designing my own, which is time I could have spent elsewhere. Uh, pitfalls. Faulty at-home hardware, as many of my classmates know. About halfway through the year, my home computer, the only one capable of running Revit, just up and died, which meant that I wasn't capable of working on Revit at home, in which I had been, at this point, working on it both at school and at home, so at half my production, which was not ideal. I just replaced the time that I would spend at home on Revit with research, eventually supplemented it, it worked out fine. And like I said, the creative freedom, figuring out where to start was a bit of a struggle, but I eventually figured it out. Uh, that's the development photo. This is just a 2D plane of the photo you just saw. Moving into the progression. Regained right at home, moved to a three-story structure, uh, first, second, and basement. Uh, at this point, it was six bedroom, five bathrooms. You can see the main changes that will happen. This wall gains glass, and this little porch area off the master bedroom gets extended. Moving in to that upstairs, you can see that uh, porch I was just referring to, or the, uh, the, the porch I was referring to off the master bedroom, and then the three bedrooms beside it, as well as the two bathrooms and then the third master bedroom. Uh, adding a downstairs, just a simple basement, adding a couple of bedrooms, a little bit of a living area, elevated bar space. I plan to uh, implement some arcade games. To, from my aunt's house, she has a little elevated area with Pac and Galaga. Wanted to borrow that, couldn't find the assets, never got around to it. And then wrapping up the home, eventually I just added that balcony in and that glass wall that I mentioned. Basically, this was just completing the final steps, going back and revising the interior and exterior. Uh, final results after texturing and everything uh, about that is roughly 17,490 square feet. It uses the large amount of glass, yes, that is large, <laughs> that incorporates in the budget heavily. Uh, large <laughs> glass from the uh, museum style. Extensive masonry work, uh, the interior courtyard and the open concept interior, you'll see that in the renders in a few photos. I hit all of the major check marks I wanted to, very proud of that. Moving into floor plans, basement hasn't changed much, if at all. Switching into the main, the main I added a little bit of uh, furnishing into the interior courtyard, a little bit of a seating area along the bar, you can't see it, but there is a TV across there. And then the bathroom added as well. And then the second floor, again, not much has changed besides that extra part. So the renders, these actually turned out pretty all right. This one's probably the worst of the bunch. This is the main hall. The camera's point of view is there, looking down. Uh, they turned out pretty all right. That was the main upstairs hall. The main entrance, as you can see, a very open floor plan, very spacious. I'm a big fan of this. Moving past that, we go into the upstairs guest bedroom. And this is where Revit and their renders really impressed me. You can see the reflection in the TV of the closet, plus the window that's not even in. That's extremely detailed, the shadowing, the rendering. They came out very nice. Uh, the downside of it was I was running this on a laptop, uh, almost burned my leg a couple of times, and I thought the computer was going to take off and fan was spinning so fast. <laughs> and moving into the master bedroom, you can't see it too much on the board. It probably shows up better on the TVs. Uh, it turned out pretty all right. The light reflecting on the bed, again, just shows the quality of the rendering software. Very big fan. Uh, the model, the model one inch on the model is 5.265 feet on the Revit scale. So the production of this, I laser cut foam board that was provided by my parents. 
a whole lot of hot glue and a whole lot of burnt fingers. I mean, all ten of them. It was bad. Blisters. It just it was fun, but it hurt. Uh, fails. Involuntary production of medium rare foam cork. You can see that right here. Ran the laser a little bit too slow and a little bit too hot. Just torched it. And also failed 3D printed scale furniture. My 3D printer at home, although relatively cheap, was pretty all right at producing what I would call medium scale models. But trying to get them to scale, they just came out as blobs. They collapsed in on themselves. They weren't recognizable. So I just supplemented them with a foam core that I hand cut. It looks better than those 3D prints did. I would prefer that to be better. Uh, the model itself, again, you're not going to be able to really see it. It'll show up better on those TV screens for you. Tried to turn down my camera's brightness as much as possible because those LEDs are aggressive against the camera. But as you can see, it turns out those are interior core wall yard. You can see all of the blue lighting along it. I tried to trim those down on the final model. These were mid-production photos. Uh, the LEDs came in pretty all right. They light up the hall, uh, lend a lot of the detail. And uh, there's a view from the main entrance. You can see the plug-in point from the upstairs hall. Moving past that to the environmental plan, the basic uh, plan was to implement sun power solar systems, Tesla power walls, and a silver level lead certification. So moving forward through that, to the sun power solar systems, why solar? Well, the simple fact of the matter is, I have no idea where I'm going to want to live in 20, 30 years. And so being reliant on geographically limited uh, power sources like geothermal, hydroelectric, means that I would have to limit the site locations. So instead, I don't need solar because well, the solar works anywhere the sun shines. And why, solar power, uh, why sun power solar panels, which is the brand that I chose, was my lead advisor, Jeanette, could not recommend them enough, so the warranties were great, installation fees were low, and that they were overall a good brand. I took her word for it, through my own research, confirmed it, and uh, implemented them. Also, the 110 panel array. Uh, unfortunately, solar is rather inefficient in the market. Uh, the common efficiency is between 15 and 18 percent. For every 100 watts hitting the panels, you're only producing 15 to 18. And for a 17,500 square foot home, you rather extensive array, uh, 110 panels was the estimate. Moving past that to the test of power walls, other shortcomings of solar, zero production at night, lower production in poor weather, which means that if you want power in, either at night or in those low production uh, conditions, you need some way to store it. Tesla power walls, you can think of as a giant solar battery, a giant solar charged battery, because that's literally what they are. They're designed to work directly with solar. They have 97.5% storage efficiency, which is great. Uh, you can stack up to 10 of them on a home. Uh, that is outstanding because your full charge of Tesla power wall is 13.5 kilowatt hours. Your average home consumes 30 kilowatt hours a day. That means with 10 power walls on the average consumption, you can power a home for roughly 4.5 days. That's a pretty decent amount. And if the sun isn't shining for 4.5 days, you probably have bigger things to worry about than the power outage. <laughs> Uh, also, they're modern and sleek. I think they fit in directly with the home. Not only is my home a big square, but these things are a big square. They're more of a rectangle, but they still fit. Uh, that leads me to lead. What is lead? Well, leadership in energy and environmental design is a certification through the U.S. Great Building Council. Basically, what it means is if you get one of these, they certify that your uh, building was constructed in a manner that is environmentally friendly, safe for the residents, and also you get a bunch of tax write-offs. So that's uh, the lead plan. Lead is a point-based system. I was aiming for a solar certification, as you can see in the bottom. Your certified base level is 40 to 49 points. Silver is 50 to 59. Gold is 60 to 79. And platinum is 80 plus. I was aiming for that silver mark, which I'll get into in a minute. I can basically break down the point scoring as I don't have enough time to get completely in depth with this. If you would like to see that, I have it on my table. Uh, but basically, you can break it into three categories. Site, construction, and design. I'm focusing on the last two. And the reason why I'm not focused on the site, as I mentioned, I have no idea where I want to live. I have no idea if the site's going to be optimal. I have no idea if the site's going to be able to meet some of those points. For example, there's a transportation point based on your access to uh, public transportation. How close are you to the bus? How close are you to the subway? Uh, you get points rewarded for that. I have no idea if I'm even going to be in the city, uh, let alone in any sort of metropolitan area. So I don't know if I'm going to be able to get those location points or site points. Construction uh, points. General summary, you want to minimize your landfill production. You want to sort and recycle what you can and just, like I said, overall minimize how much waste from the site is going into a landfill. Uh, you want to ensure optimal green and safe installation of systems. First off, you want a certified installer like for your HVAC systems, your heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. You want to make sure that you're not paying somebody who works out of their garage, but rather someone who's passed the specific certifications and tests properly.
Uh, you want to use green materials, not tropical woods. You don't want any woods from rainforests. You don't want any endangered species being incorporated in your home. And also, uh, emphasis on utilizing recycled materials, your plastics, and glasses where applicable. And also, uh, quality and high efficient appliances and technologies. Uh, Energy Star technologies are brought up a lot. You guys probably have an Energy Star fridge in your home. They're basically just energy efficient appliances. Uh, windows below certain U values. So basically, the U value of the window is how easily it transfers heat. High U values means it easily transfers heat. Low U values means it doesn't. If you have a high U value, it's easier for heat to transfer in, which means you're going to have to utilize more power to uh, air condition the house. Wasteful, not efficient, so you want lower U values. Uh, design points. General summary here. You want to design it with efficient water use and metering. Metering so that you know how much you're using efficient water use. Let's say this goes into the appliances. You want a low gallon per flush toilet. You want a low gallon per use washer. And you want a high efficiency uh, shower head, stuff like that. Just a general summary. Uh, design with use of renewable energy, geothermal and solar uh, primarily. You want to design it with those in mind. And also design with high efficiency heat and cooling. Again, this goes into the efficiency piece, partially the installation piece. You want to make sure that when you're installing it, it's doing the job as efficiently as possible with the least amount of power it can use as possible, just running for that efficiency. Uh, that leads me into the cost estimation. So to be exact, it's 17,489.8 square feet, going with a national average of $124 per square foot. This goes way up or way down. In somewhere like Detroit, it's $24. In somewhere like San Francisco, it's up to $800. $10. So this could change drastically based on your location in the country. But going off a national average of 34 square feet per labor, plus the 10 power walls, 76 grand, on top of 110 panels sub power array, that's an extra 23,375. A general rule of thumb from my expert advisor for 12% electrical costs and 14% mechanical costs, you end up with just about $3.6 million. So yeah, I'm likely not going to be building this in the future unless I'm in Power Bowl anytime soon. But uh, it's not very affordable, but it was a whole lot of fun to design. I enjoyed this project thoroughly, and that is the end. Solar is always producing 
So sometimes, the majority of homes, they don't run completely off solar. Like uh, my neighbor, Miss Lou Han, she teaches here. She has solar installed on her house. It more covers the appliances and it can sell back the extra energy back to the uh, corporation, whichever you're using, like Exxon or something like that. The thing is, over time, with the upfront cost, especially about 110 panel array, uh, I, it would just be the upfront cost because I wouldn't be paying a power bill. So it would take quite a while to build that up because the power bill, you know, it's several hundred a month versus a several thousand dollar upfront fee. I could go ahead and do the math for you. But that's okay. Yeah, that's good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's good. So would you still get the solar panels if you like to put this in like some like Seattle or maybe like no sun? Yes. Yeah, so then again, it, I, the thing about geothermal is geothermal, although expensive uh, for the size of the solar array, I'd likely need to buy property around, which is an additional charge because I can't fit it all on the roof. Which means if I had access to geothermal, I'd like to do that. But in somewhere like Seattle, I'd still need to run solar because regardless, I don't want to be tapping the grid. 